Well, good evening. Good evening. It's good to see everybody here. You know what's cool is I, when I come up here and everybody's still coming in, you hear just laughter and joy and everybody fellowshipping and talking with each other. And man, that's, that's awesome. The koinonia that we can have with each other as fellow believers. You know, we don't get that with, we don't get that with anybody else. We have one thing in common, our Lord Jesus. Amen? That's what brings us together. Hey, let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for tonight. We thank you for bringing us here. Lord, we thank you that you provide the koinonia. Lord, you provide the fellowship that we have with each other. And what a joy, what a privilege it is, Lord, especially to be here in your presence. God, I pray that, that you would reveal yourself to us. Lord, that if there was just one song that we could sing to you, that we would still be excited to sing, Lord, just that one song. If there was one verse in the Bible about you, that we would just be ecstatic that we got to read even that one verse. But you bless us, Lord, with so much. We have your entire word, Lord. We have your spirit that reveals things to us. Lord, and we have a lot of songs to worship you with. Bless your children, Lord. Pour out your spirit and draw us into your presence here tonight. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're able, let's go ahead and stand for this first song.
Father, we thank you that truly you are all that we need, and Lord, we pray that you'd be all that we long for, all that we desire. Guide us in that, Father, and help us to love you more. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Well, welcome in Jesus' name. You can be seated. Welcome to those listening on the radio and on Facebook and on the stream and all those different kinds of places. A couple quick announcements. Um, This Friday and Saturday is the Women's One Day Conference at Calvary Chapel, Reno Sparks, and there's information on the counter about that still. I think you can pretty much uh, still go to that if you want to. 
And then I got a, a kind of a, a cool treat for you guys this next Wednesday. Uh, we're going to have a guest teacher. Uh, his name is, uh, you know him, his name is Andrew Morales. He, he was here once before, uh, a few months back, actually when I was in Israel. Uh, he came and taught, and so, uh, or when I was in uh, Nepal or something. Anyway, uh, he's a really good teacher. He's a young guy. You're going you're gonna to like him. And so uh, next Wednesday evening, I just encourage you to be here uh, and to hear him teach. And then on uh, November 10th, we're going to have the uh, Operation Christmas Child Shoebox collection time. And uh, after the second service on that Sunday, uh, we'll, we'll kind of get a group together and uh, prepare the boxes to get them off to the uh, destination point. And then uh, November 28th is uh, Thanksgiving. That's Thursday evening. And we're going to have a, a church Thanksgiving dinner here for those that want to be part of that. And I uh, just encourage you, if you don't have a place to be or, or family to be with, then please come and enjoy Thanksgiving dinner with uh, your church family because uh, you'll be loved done and we're, we're going to worship the Lord in an awesome way. And then we're going to decorate the church uh, November 30th. That's a Saturday. It usually takes three or four hours in the morning and we kind of just uh, Christmas the whole thing out and uh, it'll look pretty cool. And so looking forward to that. Father, we thank you for bringing us here tonight. Uh, we thank you for the opportunity to worship you. And we ask truly, Father, that you be glorified this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's continue to worship.
Jesus, we thank you that you never fail us. You truly are more than a friend. You're our shepherd. You're our healer. You're our provider. And you are faithful to the end. And we worship you, Jesus. We thank you for all the times that so faithful. You have blessed us beyond our imagination. Jesus, you have brought us through the fire, through the waters, through the storm, Lord. darkest nights 
You are close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend And I have lived in the goodness of God And all my life All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able And I will sing of the goodness of God And all my life And all my life you have been
deserve it Still you give yourself away Know the overwhelming Never-ending selfless love of God
Gracious Father, it's that, it's that overwhelming, selfless love, Lord, that you've poured out on each of our hearts and each of our lives. And we're here today, and Lord, in response to that, you've initiated your love. Help us now, Lord, to respond back to you, that we love you back. Thank you, Father, for what you're going to do here tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We welcome in Jesus' name. Why don't you turn and say hello to somebody? I'm going to stand here. <laughs> well, hey, it's time to pray for the little ones going off to Sunday school or Wednesday school. All right. You guys ready? Mm -hmm. You ready? Okay. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for these awesome kids. We thank you for blessing us and being our God and taking care of us, Lord. We thank you for taking care of them. And, and we ask that your hand of blessing would be upon each of them today, that you would Show yourself, Lord, that you would reveal yourself to each of these little hearts and draw them to you, Lord. Bless those who are ministering to them. May they reflect your love and your joy to these kids. Thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Go get them. <laughs> well, tonight is a special night. Uh, we're going to do an overview of the book of Colossians. And, you know, we've been studying through uh, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, and done a pretty detailed study. And it's always kind of a, a challenge to try and do an overview of a book like this because uh, there's so much that you want to just kind of... You, you never feel quite like you do it justice, you know, because there's so much there. But uh, we're going to try anyway. And so what we're going to do is we're going to uh, read through chapter one together, and then we'll... Uh, uh, basically go through chapter by chapter and, uh, and just get the, the main points, if you will, in, in, in an overview kind of a way. And so once you get your Bibles open to Colossians chapter 1, uh, if you're able, would you stand with me uh, in reverence for God's Word as we read it together? Colossians chapter 1, uh, beginning out verse 1, it says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are in Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you since we heard of your faith in, Jesus, in Christ Jesus and of your love for all the saints because of the hope which is laid upon you in heaven, of which you heard before in, in the word of truth of the gospel, which has come to you as it has also in all the world and is bringing forth fruit. As it, is, as it is also among you since the day you heard it and knew the grace of God in truth, as you also learned from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, who also declared to us your love in the Spirit. For this reason we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power, for all patience and long suffering with joy, giving thanks to the Father, who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of his love, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, 
the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. And you, who were once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he is reconciled in the body of his flesh through death, to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight, if indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. I now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and, and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church, for which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God, which is given to me for you, to fulfill the word of God, the mystery which has been hidden from the ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. To this end I labor, striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. Gracious Father, we ask that you would work in us mightily tonight. Lord, we ask that you would help us as we as we review these chapters, Lord, that you just bring these scriptures and these passages back to our remembrance, Lord. You would help us to remember the things that you've taught us. Guide us, Lord, to kind of get the big picture and help us, Lord, all the more just to hear your voice. We love you, Lord, and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. You can be seated. In the way of introduction, and just kind of, again, part of the review, uh, the author of this book is the Apostle Paul. Uh, it was written to uh, the church in Colossae, and Colossae is, is, a, is a city uh, in uh, Phrygia. Uh, step out of the way here a little bit, but uh, you can see over here is the, the city of Ephesus, and then about 100 miles to the east is the city of Colossae. Right next to that is Laodicea. And so uh, it's, you know, right basically in the middle of Asia. And this letter was written specifically to that church. Uh, at the end of the letter, then it, Paul says, well, make sure you give this letter to the Laodiceans and get the letter I wrote from them to yourself so you can kind of trade it back and forth, like, I guess like baseball cards or whatever. But, uh, you know, so you can read what was written to each one and, and glean from that. And so the Colossian church wasn't actually founded by Paul. It was probably an outgrowth uh, of the Ephesian church, again, about 100 miles away. And thus, his introduction as an apostle. It was written approximately uh, 64 AD uh, during Paul's imprisonment in Rome. And the theme of this book overall is the uh, preeminence of Christ. Uh, the purpose uh, essentially was to correct a couple of common heresies of that time. Uh, it was uh, uh, one of those was Gnosticism, and uh, my yeah okay I'm good uh, uh, Gnosticism, which denies really the deity of Christ. And then uh, the Judaizers, or Judaism, uh, which mixes works with faith for salvation. And so, you know, he's uh, trying to correct a couple things there. Uh, the Colossians may have been attempting to blend in or embrace in some way some of the vain philosophies uh, of the world, uh, something that's actually common to the church today. You see the church in general oftentimes adopting uh, worldly philosophy, worldly behavior, those kinds of things, trying to appeal to people or trying to be more relevant, that kind of stuff. And uh, no different that day. And so uh, Paul writes to the Corinthians perhaps to correct some of those things. Uh, we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 19, uh, for the wisdom of the world is foolishness with God. And so to use uh, worldly wisdom or, or the philosophy of the world is just, just that foolishness. Paul tells them uh, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, in my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And so he's describing that his, his teaching and his preaching were essentially uh, spirit-filled. He was led by the Spirit to teach as he did, and that their faith would be in God and God's Word and not in Paula or his teaching per se. But 
But anyway, uh, in chapter 1, uh, the overall theme of this chapter is uh, the deity of Christ and faith, hope, and love. And so it starts off with the typical uh, Pauline salutation in the first couple of verses. Uh, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, uh, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are in Colossae. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And so you read that it's Paul, not Saul, uh, because he's a new creature in Christ Jesus. And he mentions the fact that he's an apostle, uh, something he does as he writes to the Corinthians, the Galatians, the Ephesians, Colossians, and also at one point to Timothy. Uh, he's an apostle as opposed to a servant, or an apostle as opposed to uh, a prisoner. Uh, when he wrote to the Romans, the Philippians, and, and Titus, he mentioned these other titles, but here he makes mention the fact that he is an apostle and, and called of God to that ministry. Uh, Pastor Chuck used to teach us that uh, we should be able to insert our names and our occupation in these verses. You know, Mike, a pastor or teacher of Jesus Christ by the will of God. You know, Nick, a barista by the will of God. Or you know, <laughs> Truly, I mean, God puts us in those places uh, uh, for that purpose. And so I, I believe that God calls us to all those things. In verse 2, it says, to the saints and the faithful brethren in Christ who are in Colossae. And so the, the, the word, the, the name, the phrase saints and, and faithful brethren who are in Colossae. Writing to the saints. I've always said it's better to be a saint than an ain't, you know. And uh, uh, speaking of believers in general, uh, the word there for saint in the Greek language is hagios. And it means to be holy or set apart, uh, to be sanctified or consecrated, devoted, if you will, to the service of God. Uh, and and I, I know there are different, different definitions of saints, but generally it's referring to believers in Jesus Christ. Uh, speaking of those who are holy and pure and set apart and sanctified by the blood of the Lamb. And so the question might be, well, how do you become a saint? And we see the, uh, the answer to that in the context here that gives us a clue. To the saints and faithful brethren in Christ. And so put your faith in Christ and you become a saint. And I like that. You know, Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 2, Verses 8 and 9, For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And so uh, this letter is written specifically to the saints, to the believers, uh, to the faithful brethren in Colossae. And then we read uh, again part of his uh, typical salutation, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And, you know, the order is always important. Uh, the grace always comes first, grace to you, and then, you know, the peace. And we must first experience the grace of God before we can experience the peace of God. You know, it's kind of a one-two punch, but it's always in that order. And I like the, when he says there, God our Father. You know, it's a, it's a little word and it's a little, you know, observation, but, you know, it's not God the Father, not God my Father, but it's God our Father. Why? Because we have the same Father. It's inclusive. He's writing to the Colossians as brothers in the Lord. And, and I like that, that he's writing to, you know, dear friends and, and, and they're all related. In verse 4, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all the saints uh, because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven. And so they had a good reputation. Their little church, their fellowship, however big or small it was, their reputation had preceded them. Uh, the love that they had one for another. And, and this is exactly what Jesus exhorted them to. You know, in John 13, 35, Jesus said, By this all men shall know that you're my disciples if you have love one for another. And so they had that that love that was manifested to each other. You know, in his letter to the Corinthians, Paul stressed uh, that faith and hope and love are important, but that the greatest of these was love. And we see the same kind of combination of, of phrases here, your faith in Christ Jesus, your love for all the saints because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven. So we have faith, hope, and love again mixed together. You know, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 13, 13, and now abide faith, hope, love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. And so they're all brought together here in these verses. In verse 5 again, it says, Because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you've heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. And so the hope that's laid up for us. You know, sometimes you, we need to think about what that hope is. And, 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 and very specifically, that hope is Jesus. You know, heaven is just where he lives. And so we get to be with him. We get to have uninterrupted fellowship and communion and koinonia with him. I'm looking forward to that. You know, there's times when I study till I can't sit anymore. There's times I study till my eyes are falling out, it feels like. 
You know, and there's times I'm studying or praying and then the phone rings or different needs come up or I get distracted by the only things in my brain. You know, and it's like, ah, you know. And, and, but there's a coming time when we're going to have uninterrupted fellowship and communion and koinonia with him and the phone's not going to ring. You know, you're not going to get a text message at the wrong moment. And, and it's going to be awesome. Uh, looking forward to that. But the hope. You know, Peter tells us in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, according to his abundant mercy, has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. In um, verse 15, skipping ahead just a little bit, uh, describing the preeminence of Jesus, said he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. And so Jesus is literally the image of God the Father, our best representation of him. You know, people make pictures uh, and paintings and statues, images of various kinds trying to depict Jesus. But I've never seen anybody pointedly try to do that of, quote, unquote, God the Father. We know that he's a spirit. But at the same time, Jesus is the representation of the Father. He is the, the Godhead incarnate. In fact, Jesus told his disciples in John chapter 14, verse 9, he that has seen me has seen the Father. And so if you've got a, a, an image of Jesus in your mind, and I, I would just... I don't know, encourage you not to think about the pictures you've seen or the statues you've seen, but to think about the, the verses that you've heard that describe his love, that describe his faithfulness, that describe his gentleness and his, and his truthfulness and all those different things. And the, the, the picture that we would have wouldn't be a, a physical picture, but it would be kind of a mental composite of the attributes of God. And, and that's the best picture I can think of. We're told in Hebrews uh, chapter 1, uh, verses 1, 2, and 3, it says, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he has by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. But, but he being the brightness of of his glory and the express image of his person. And, and while we can't picture him like an image, we can kind of have that composite picture, if you will, of, of what he is like. Because he's not a specific image. Uh, he is, and because he's not a specific image, I believe he is God for all men, for all mankind. And, and that's what he intends to be, not just one group. It says they're also the firstborn over all creation. And it's the firstborn in the sense of priority and honor and sovereignty. Uh, Wiest interprets it that way anyway. Smith's Bible Dictionary defines firstborn this way, uh, prime, most excellent, most distinguished. And so it, it's the firstborn in, in, in the sense of honor and priority as opposed to being you know, a, a created being. In fact, uh, Paul is, is saying that Jesus is the preeminent one. And the next few verses, the context of them, would certainly refute any error that would imply that Jesus was a created being, being the creator of all things. Uh, in verse 16, uh, for by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. I, I like this. I, you know, I'm not too confused about the, what the word all means. It means everything. And, and, and it, it, you don't have to interpret that. Jesus is the creative force within the, the triunity of God. In fact, in uh, the Gospel of John, backs this up in, in John chapter 1, the first few verses. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. And so Jesus is the creative power of God. Jesus spoke, and literally all creation leapt into existence. In uh, Psalm 33, verse 6, By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. Jesus simply spoke the word, and it all just leapt into existence. All things were created through him and for him. This is one of the things where we, we come to understand what, how we fit into this puzzle, how we fit into what God is doing in the world in general. We were created to please God. We were created to have fellowship with him. In Revelation chapter 4, verse 11, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. 
when you understand your purpose and meaning in life, I don't know why, but there's just a peace that comes over me when I think about this is why I'm here. This is my purpose. This is my destination. I, I know what I'm supposed to be doing. And it's simply to seek out and to please Him. In verse 17, And He is before all things, and in Him all things consist. You know, He is before all things. He's first in every way. And the word consist literally means that all things are held together by Him. You know, I read uh, Hebrews 1, uh, 3 earlier, and it says, Who being the brightness of His glory and the express image of His person, and upholding all things by the word of His power. Jesus keeps literally everything together. I wish I could keep myself together, let alone anybody, any of you guys, but he keeps all things together. If he just let go, everything would just evaporate and disappear. It'd be a, a weird thing. In verse 18, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. And again, this is one of the, uh, the main points of this book, the preeminence of Jesus, that he is first and foremost in all things. And I want to just encourage you and exhort you to allow Jesus to be first and foremost in your life. It, it could be a difficult thing to, to allow him to have that primary spot in our life where everything is subservient to him. But when he has that place in our life, it's amazing how life just kind of gets itself organized and falls into place. So he's the head of all things, including the church, uh, and, and it's his church. He's the firstborn from the dead. It's interesting, again, uh, and he is the head of the church who is the beginning of the firstborn from the dead, again, that he might have uh, the preeminence in all things. But uh, he is the firstborn from the dead. And again, in, in the same sense, preeminently. Uh, others were raised from the dead before Jesus was born even in, you know, in the Old Testament. But all those people that were raised from the dead, like when Elijah raised people from the dead kind of stuff, they all died again. You know, uh, there are other people that were raised by the prophets, and they died again. But when Jesus was raised from the dead, he was raised to everlasting life. He didn't die. So he was the first one to be raised from the dead to everlasting life. And so he's the, the preeminent one in all that. In verse 19, For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell. And so it's pleasing to the Father that Jesus should have that right place in our lives, the preeminent position, if you will, in our hearts. In Jesus all the fullness is all the fullness of God the Father. In um, uh, Ephesians chapter 1, uh, verses 21 and forward, it says, describing Jesus, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. And so, you know, Paul kind of pushes this theme in a couple different books, in a sense, that the, the preeminence of Jesus. And then finally, for this chapter anyway, in verse 20, it says, and by, him, uh, and, and by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him whether things on earth or things in heaven, or made it, having made peace through the blood of his cross. And so, by him, uh, only by him we have peace with God through the blood of the cross of Jesus. This is very, very specific. And, and I, I had to kind of edited out a whole bunch of uh, verses that kind of describe this, but the best one I thought of was John chapter 14, verse 6, where it says, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no man comes to the Father except through me. And so it's a very specific way. This leads us now to chapter 2, and chapter 2 is about the sufficiency of Christ and the fact that the law uh, was fulfilled or completed in Christ Jesus. If you will, look at verse 9 for a moment. It says, For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And the word for fullness there is, plur, plur, I can't even pronounce it, pleroma. Uh, and it means uh, a completion. Uh, it's, it, it describes a container that is completely filled almost to overflowing. In other words, you can't get anything else in it. And Paul is telling us that Jesus is truly God incarnate. There's no need to look anywhere else because he is the fullness of God. That's why we read in John chapter 1, verse 14, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glories, the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Then in verse 10, it says, And you are complete in him, who was the head of all principality and power. If you've received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and the Holy Spirit's come to live in you, then you are complete in him. Now, 
He, it doesn't mean that his work in you is completed. You know, he's still working in each and every one of us, but we have the fullness of the Spirit in us. I, I've told people before, you know, it, it, when you get saved, the first day that you get saved and put your hope and your faith in Jesus, you're as saved as you're ever going to be. You may learn more about Jesus along the way. You may come to a, a deeper, better understanding of what it cost him to provide that salvation. You may come to a, a deeper understanding of, of who you are and, and the depth of your own depravity and thereby make you even more grateful to be saved. But you're just as saved on that day as you were the very first day you got saved. You're, you're complete in him. There's nothing left to do. And I like that. Our salvation is complete in Jesus. It can't be improved on. It can't be added to. And that's the problem with a lot of religions and cults and isms. They keep saying, well, the blood of Christ wasn't sufficient. You've got to do you know, X, Y, or Z and, and somehow make up for what Jesus lacked. And to me, that's blasphemy, saying that his blood was insufficient, saying his, his sacrifice on the cross wasn't good enough. We are complete in Christ Jesus. There's nothing you have to add to that. In John chapter 1, verse 16, it says, And of his fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. Of his fullness have we all received. We are as, we're, we're as full of the Holy Spirit as we're going to be. God fills his temple. In uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16, Know ye not that you're the temple of God, and that the, the Spirit of God dwells within you? That, that when you're a born-again Christian, you're, you're filled up with the Holy Spirit. In verse 14, uh, still in uh, chapter 2, it says, uh, Having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. And so Paul is talking about the blotting out of ordinances or religious rules. Not God's rules per se, but the works of the law uh, that led to religious, if you will, self-righteousness, all of which led us away from God, taking these things and nailing them to the cross along with all of our sins. I love this, that the, the law has been fulfilled in Christ Jesus. It hasn't been nullified. It hasn't been tossed aside. It was fulfilled that Jesus met the righteous requirements of the law on our behalf, and, and thereby we're no longer subject to the law. You know, Paul tells the Ephesians in Ephesians chapter 2, uh, verses 15 and 16, having abolished or destroyed in his flesh the enmity, that is, the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. And so we're no longer at odds with God. We're no longer at odds with the law itself, again, because it's been fulfilled. Then in verse 20, it says, uh, Therefore, if you died with Christ from the basic principles of the world, why as though living in the world do you subject yourselves to regulations? I am blown away by, by you know, Christians that want to put themselves back under the law. You know, I, 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 I've interacted and conversed with some of the people in our own community. Uh, they call themselves Torah observant Christians, or uh, um, you know, and I think you, you really want to have to you know be under the the law of the Sabbath and uh, the, the law of circumcision and kosher foods and all this stuff. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and it's like why? That was a lot of work. And Jesus did all the work. We don't have to do all that stuff. Aren't you glad? I mean, wouldn't it be a bummer to have to, you know, every, every time you sin or, you know, go find a goat or a lamb or something and have to bring it down to the church and, you know, make it into lamb chops and all that stuff? It'd be like, what a bummer. You know, what a, what a bunch of work. And, and Jesus died. That he, he's the perfect sacrifice. We can't add to that. We can't, we can't make it any better. And so, as I read verse 20, therefore, if you died with Christ from the basic principles of the world, you know, dead men are no longer subject to the law. You know, uh, if a man is killed in an attempted bank robbery, he goes in and he goes, you know, give me all your money, and somebody just blasts him, you know, and boom, he's dead in the bank. They don't drag his carcass into court and charge him with a crime and, and have a trial for a dead body because since he's dead, He's no longer subject to the law. And if we died in Christ Jesus, then we're no longer subject to the power of the law either. We've been delivered from that. We've been freed from the power of sin and death. And, and we need that kind of, in a sense, act like it. You know, trust that, that what, what God's done for us is true. Paul writes to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, Therefore, 
if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Well, looking at uh, chapter 3, uh, the, the, the gist of chapter 3, it describes our lives in Christ and being the new man, the new creature in Christ that he describes back in 2 Corinthians 5. In uh, chapter 3 and verse 1, it says, If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand. Uh, I read that phrase, if then. I, I just kind of think, well, since you were raised with Christ, you know, seek those things which are above. And, um, you know, uh, if then or since or because you were raised with Christ, in a certain sense, he says, if you're going to be a Christian, act like it. That's a, good, <laughs> that's a good admonition for a lot of Christians, myself included. If you're going to claim to be a Christian, let's act like it, shall we? You know, and, and that's kind of what Paul is describing. In, in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8, he says, For you were once darkness, but now you're light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. So many Christians, you know, they're, they're trying to appeal to the world, and, and different churches are trying to appeal to the, the world to such a degree that you can't tell them not of the world. You know, they just blend in so, you know, and, and I don't think that we have to be outlandish in our behavior or, you know, always wear what would a Jesus do t-shirt, you know, or that kind of stuff. Uh, I, I think that we can be a good witness and, and be different enough just by our behavior and our speech that we don't have to be weird. I think that we just have to live in a community and live like a, like a, like a Christian. And so walk as children of light. Then in verse 2 he says, set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. You know that phrase, set your mind. That's not something that happens by accident. He's saying you determine, you control. You know, the, the spirit now has power over the flesh. The flesh is no longer dominant, having you know, been killed. Now you can determine what you will think and what you will do and so on. Set your mind. We can actually control our minds. There's some things that come to us and you can't avoid it, but you can, you can chuck it just as fast. You know, the, the, the real battle in Christianity is between the ears. It's the battlefield of the mind. So much of what happens starts off in our hearts and our mind where we, we think things through. Have you ever just been having a good day and all of a sudden you're just mad as all get up? And, and you're just walking down the street, minding your own business, whistling, watching the birds fly by, and that kind of stuff, butterflies are everywhere. And then all of a sudden, boom, and you, you just get angry and, whoosh, and you start to spiral down. And, and sometimes we roll with that, but that's a, that's a spiritual attack. That's the enemy coming after you. And you know, I've had that happen to me more times than I can tell you, but you know what? You can stop and say, Lord, help me. Forgive me for entertaining those thoughts. And, and Lord, guide me and, and redirect me. And you can start singing praises to him. And you can start praying and, and thanking God. And you can start praying for your brothers and sisters. And you can literally change the way you're thinking. How many parents have told their, their kids, you better get a better attitude. Or you better start, you know. And, and we make our kids change their attitude at times, don't we? And so it's possible, even when you're a bigger kid. And so we have to be careful to set our minds. You know, Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 4 and 5, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God, for the pulling down of strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. You know, I'll be honest with you, there's, you know, I wish I could tell you that you know, I, every thought that I think is a good, pure thought. But the truth of the matter is, my heart is just as wicked and maybe more wicked than, and deceitful than many of you people that are sitting here tonight. And I have to deal with my own wicked heart. And, and thoughts come up sometimes, and I think, oh, and I, you know, I think that I've dealt with a certain sin. I think I've dealt with my anger or my profanity or different things. And something happens. And now, I don't necessarily speak a profane word, but there'll be a profane word that comes right up. I mean, it's right on the edge of my lips, man. It's almost coming out. And I'm thinking, Lord, I thought you took profanity from me. I said, well, there's still some debt deep down in there. There's still some, obviously. That's what's coming out of my heart. But I have to take that thought captive and say, Lord, you know, Rid me of this. Forgive me, Lord, for thinking that way. And, and, and I go through the whole process and I begin to pray and stuff. But it, it's the idea that we have to take our thoughts into captivity. And there's been times I, I, I'm taking a shower. I'm just getting cleaned up, you know. And I think about an incident where I got into an argument with another police officer 25 years ago. 
And I start going down, well, I shouldn't have said this, I should, you know, and I start getting all angry about it again. And I, you know, but I win the argument, by the way, because I'm you know, the only one arguing. And I, and, and I go down the spiral, and I go, stop. That person, they're not thinking about this. They don't care about that stupid little nothing. I've got to take that thought into captivity. And, we, and, and God doesn't call us to do anything that he hasn't actually enabled us to do. And so when he says, take your thoughts, control your thoughts, we are able to control our thoughts. We can choose what we think about. There's times when I choose to daydream, when I should be, you know, studying. There's times when I choose to think about certain things, when I should be worshiping God or praying. And, and there's those times when I, I'm worshiping, and all of a sudden I'm thinking, you know, middle of worship, and I think, what's for lunch? And Lord, forgive me. And then I get back to worshiping. But we can control that, and so we should. That's what he's calling us to. In verse 5, he says, Therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth, uh, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. And he says, Therefore, you know, because of these things, because you're taking your thoughts captive and all that, put to death your members. And then there's this list of things, you know, fornication, uncleanness, and evil desires, and all that stuff. And, and, and I'll tell you what, if you don't mortify these things, as the King James says, or if you don't put these things to death, as the New King James says, if you don't put them to death, they will put you to death. If you don't deal with your sin in a biblical way, it will kill you. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. And so therefore, because of all those things, put that stuff to death. And, and, and the list gets longer there. We won't have to go through the whole thing. But it's not good enough just to kill those things, to put off those things. The next thing in our, 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 our list of things to do, because it, you know, I go right back to verse 1 again, if you're really a Christian, we're called to walk in the light, right? So that you're going to put off certain things, then you're going to put on certain things. You're going you're to stop doing certain things, but then you're going to fill that void with the things of God. And so in verse 10 it says, and... And, and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. And so, you know, being transformed, put on the new man, be different. I, I love Romans 12 too when it says, and be not conformed to the world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. That you may know what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You know, when I was a kid growing up during the, the, the 60s and 70s and there was the, the, the Soviet Union and all this kind of stuff and they talked about brainwashing and, you know, the, the commies were going to get you and all that kind of stuff. So I, brainwashing back then was a bad thing. Today, I think brainwashing is really good. I want my brain washed. I want my, the way I think to be different. I want it to be purified. I want to put it on a double agitation for a little while, you know, and get some of that junk out of there. But the renewing of our mind, the transformation of our mind, that we would think differently, that we would adopt a biblical worldview, that we would adopt a, a, a godly perspective, a biblical perspective on life and all the issues of life. And so being transformed. Look at verses uh, 12, 13, and 14. It says, Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on. And so these are the specific things that we're going to put on. Put on tender mercies and kindness, and humility, and meekness, and long-suffering, bearing with one another, and, and forgiving one another. And if anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so also you must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. And so, as it mentions there in, um, in verse 12, the elect of God, most of the references that you'll see in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, when it talks about the elect, it's talking about the Jewish people. But in the New Testament, basically it's talking about, it's a reference to believers, the elect of God, the chosen of God, if you will. Now, as the elect, and because we are holy and beloved, we are told to put on the attributes of God. You know, John the Baptist said, he must increase and I must decrease. And I, and I say the same thing for myself. I wish there would be more of Jesus coming out of me and less of Mike coming out of me. That when people hear me speak or talk or, or, or different things, that they would realize it's not me, it's him. If it's wise, if it's smart, it's him, trust me. But that he gets the glory. But, but I want to have the attributes of Christ. I want to be loving the way he's loving. And, and, and now as the elect, because we're holy and beloved, we're to put on 
Again, the attributes of God. And they're all consistent with the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, Paul describes this in Galatians chapter 5, uh, verses 22 and 23, when he says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. When you know people like this, you're drawn to them. You know, when you, when you think about the fruit of the flesh, you know, that's stated previously in that same chapter, and you, you know people like that, you run from them. You don't, ah, I don't, want, I don't want to hang out with that person. And that's because you don't want to be like them. They're just not nice to be around. But the people that are more like Jesus, that are more like Christ-like in their behavior, we're drawn to them. But he says, he says there, put on. Again, it's the same thing that when you set your mind. That's a deliberate act. And when you put on the attributes of Christ, that's also a deliberate act. And, and I'll be honest with you, there's times when I am acting. <laughs> when I put on patience, inside I am just like, let's go. But on the outside, I'm going, oh, that's nice. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and, and I'm, I'm putting it on, hoping that if I just act like that, God will make that a reality in my heart. And I don't think it's a bad thing to do. Because I'm naturally an impatient person. I, I'm not always the things that are listed here, but I want to be, and, I, and I'm trying not to be hypocritical about it, but I'm asking God to make me those things. And sometimes I have to just put on the smile or, or just be you know, temperate or, or patient or whatever and trusting that God's going to make that true in my life. In, in verse 13, he says, bearing with one another, that means putting up with each other. I think Christians really need to learn how to put up with each other because there's a bunch of weirdos in Christianity. There's a bunch of goofballs. That's all of us, by the way. And what I'm saying is, you know, sometimes people get so offended in church and they leave or they get mad about stuff. But none of us is perfect. And we need to be loving and kind. And bottom line is, like it says, they're bearing with one another and forgiving one another. You know, um, just as Jesus forgave us, that's how we should forgive. When Paul describes love in, in 1 Corinthians in, in chapter 13, verse 4, he says, love suffers long. It's patient. And it's kind. And, and, and bless you and, and all the rest of you. And, uh, but the idea is that, that God is patient and kind, but not just with the cool-looking ones. Aren't you glad? Not just the ones that, you know, that are really spiritual. Aren't you glad? He's patient and kind with all of us, and that's how we're supposed to be. You know, forgiving one another. If, if anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. Now, he says the same thing to the Ephesians. This isn't just something that's unique to the Colossian church. In Ephesians 4.32, and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God and Christ forgave you. You know, I pray that I could be more tenderhearted. You know, I, I'm working on being gentle. I think tenderhearted is coming up next. But, you know, it's one of those things that, you know, we, you can have your persona, you can have the way that you act or behave, you know, but there's times when even the most gruff person needs to demonstrate that kind of tenderness in a situation to really reach and minister to somebody. I was told a long time ago, it's not always what you say, but it's how you say it. And sometimes there's such a need uh, for it to be tenderhearted. Uh, forgiveness and love are connected to one another. Peter tells us in 1 Peter 4, 8, and above all things, have fervent love one for another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. How does love cover a multitude of sins? Through forgiveness. It begins with the forgiveness that Jesus extended to us, and that same forgiveness, hopefully, that we can extend to others. That's how we cover a multitude of sins. In verse 14, the exhortation to love one another, but above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. So we are called by God, to love one another. You know, uh, reading in 1 John chapter 4, verse 11, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Again, it's a reflection of what our God has done for us. I mentioned that earlier, but, uh, you know, John chapter 13, verse 35, By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. You know, Christians, I almost at times wish they would just ban Christian t-shirts. You know, or, and banned Christian bumper stickers. You, know, you ever put a bumper sticker in your car? You know, I love Jesus and sold the car. Some other maniac gets it and drives all over town, you know, and it's like, hey, you know. 
I'd rather have people look at us individually, not look at signs, not look at stuff that they can read and you know, get a clue, but they would have to actually just observe our lives and hopefully at the end of the day they would come to the conclusion that person's a Christian because of how they're kind and, and polite and, and gentle and tender and truthful and all those different kinds of things. You know, John's pretty hardcore. Uh, I think First John's one of those books that makes you bleed, but uh, in, in First John chapter 4, verses 20 and 21, if someone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he's a liar. Uh, for he who, does, he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he's not seen? And this commandment have we from him that, that he who loves God must love his brother also. But someone who says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. That's God. This is God's word, not mine. That's pretty hardcore. But it says as well here, you know, that... Uh, the bond of perfection, the, the bond being that which binds together, and, and love really is the glue of unity. Whether you put a husband and wife together, whether you put a boyfriend and girlfriend together, or you know, teammates or whatever, we're all going to get along to a certain point. <laughs> but in every relationship, there's going to come a rub at some point. Every relationship, no matter how good. And when that day comes, what's going to carry the day? Love one for another. That you just look, oh yeah, they're different. You know, yeah, you know, they 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 march to the beat of a different drum or whatever. You know, and, and we're gracious and we're kind and we're quote unquote loving, because God has been so loving to us. We don't have to be perfect matches in every single respect in life. That's part of the uniqueness and the beauty of the variety that we have. I'm glad my wife's not exactly like me, because I wouldn't like to look at her. <laughs> You know, I'm glad that uh, my kids are different than me because we can have more lively conversations. I have enough dumb conversations with myself. You know, there has to be those differences, but they, they complement each other. And, 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 and because of the grace that we demonstrate, we pray. And, and because of the power that God gives us to be loving one to another, it's walking in the Spirit. That's how you can tell someone's walking in the Spirit when they're just they're loving and kind and gentle and, and, you know, that it's God doing that work in them. So the bond of perfection. He goes on in this chapter to give us some specific points on the practicality, again, of our faith, what that looks like. In um, uh, verses 18 and 19, he, he addresses marriage. Uh, he starts off with, you know, wives submit to your own husbands as is fitting to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be bitter towards them. Again, these are things that we could uh, uh, make a whole sermon on any one of these points. And I'm just going to kind of blow through them. In verse 20, he addresses a relationship with their kids. You know, children obey your parents uh, in all things, for this is well-pleasing in the Lord. Then uh, verse 20, children obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing in the Lord. And just one more time, uh, verse 20, children obey your parents in all things. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Sorry, broken record, just like at home. Um, verses 22 and 23, uh, bond servants obey all things, uh, your masters, obey your masters in all things according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in sincerity of heart, fearing God. And whatever you do, do it heartily as it's to the Lord and not to men. And so again, the, the exhortation for servants to be good employees, you know, to, to be hard workers and to be diligent and, and to be a good witness perhaps through your work ethic, you know, and your productivity and your attitude. You know, these are all very important things that, that stand out. Uh, in chapter 4, uh, Paul is going to make a few more kind of practical points. And then he's going to kind of wind it down with uh, the benediction. But the, uh, the theme of this chapter, basically it's uh, a, a couple more points, practical points, but then it's Paul's request uh, and, and, and personal matters. You know, he basically asks everybody, hey, pray for me. And then he gives kind of a, a benediction. Uh, in verse 1 he says, Masters, give your bondservants what is just and fair knowing that you also have a master in heaven. And so it's the idea, he's calling employers to pay their employees a fair wage. And, uh, you know, give them what is just and fair. And, and it kind of throws in, because you have a master in heaven. In other words, you're going to be accountable. <laughs> you know, you're, you're, not, you're not the big bad boss you think you are, because you, there's somebody else just above you, or way above you actually, that will deal with you if you don't deal correctly with them. And so there is that aspect of accountability. You know, Jesus even says in, in Luke chapter 10, verse 7, that labor is worthy of his wages. You know, I, I know ministries, sadly, that 
um, you know, pay minimum wage to their employees. And it's like, I don't know. I mean, if, if they don't have the money to do it, I guess they don't. But it's like, um, that's the reason why I don't have an assistant pastor. Our church, I, I, I could get an assistant pastor next week. But I want to make sure if we do, he's going to get a fair wage and be able to live and all that kind of stuff. And so it's like, well, we'll wait till we can do that. You know, because that's what God, I think, calls all of us to. Uh, in verse 2, he says, continue earnestly in prayer, uh, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. And, uh, and so continue in prayer. And he says, continue earnestly or, or be persistent in prayer. You know, uh, there are times when I think that we should be sensitive to leading and the guiding of the Spirit. You just pray on the spot. You know, you, you see a need, you, you get a prayer request from somebody, you, you're driving down the road and you see a, a crash or something, and boom, you just begin to pray for the obvious need that you see or perceive. But there's also times when, you know, I've been praying, as an example for my dad and my brother and my sister and my uncles for years for their salvation. And I, I've been tempted many times just to like, well, Lord, I'm just, you know, and there, and there are certain things, honestly, in life that I have given up praying for because God told me no so many times I figured I better stop. But, you know, but there's things that we need to be persistent in. And, 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 and so to be faithful that way and just continue to pray. The Lord loves to hear our prayers. He, he, it's music to his ears. You know, in Psalm 34, verse 15, the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their cry. God wants us to pray with them. You know, Paul writes to Timothy in, in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8, I desire, therefore, that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting, that we would praise God and, and pray to God and, and pray with thanksgiving in our hearts and not doubt, but trust that God will do, what he, and do his will in his, in his time. Then Paul gets very specific in verse 3, meanwhile, praying also for us, that God would open to us a door for the word to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I also am in chains. Some people, and I'm not sure if there's any of you, I'm just saying it in a very generic kind of sense, some people won't ask for prayer for themselves. Whether it's an issue of pride or you know, uh, self-sufficiency, or I don't know what it would be, but Paul wasn't too, pr too proud to ask for prayer. And if he's not too proud to ask for prayer, I just encourage you, if you've got stuff going on, and you're praying about it yourself, then maybe consider sharing that with somebody else. Say, will you pray for me? And, and there, there's power in prayer. God changes hearts and lives and circumstances and all kinds of cool stuff. You know, James tells us that we have not because we ask not or because we ask amiss. And so the encouragement that as Paul is asking for prayer, I think that we should be asking for prayer as well. In verse 5, he says, walk in wisdom towards those who are outside, redeeming the time. And so walk in wisdom, that means, you know, exercise some thought there. But he says, towards those who are outside, consider your witness to non-believers. And I think that every Christian should be very careful about their witness to their neighbors and to their co-workers and to, to, to people that don't understand Christ Jesus. You know, even to the point of being willing to lose an argument with another Christian even to the point of being, being taken advantage of by another Christian, so as to preserve our witness before the unbelieving world around us. I don't mean compromising in you know, our theology or the essentials of Christ, those kinds of things, but sometimes Christians get into petty arguments about stupid stuff in front of non-believers <laughs> who wonder how, how Christ has impacted your life. You can't even figure this out. You know? It's my parking spot. No, it's my parking you know, Whatever. And so Paul gives them the exhortation to walk in wisdom. In, in, to the Ephesians, he wrote pretty much the same thing. In Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 and 16, he said, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. To both churches, to the Colossians and to the Ephesians, he said, Walk carefully, walk circumspectly, redeeming the time. Don't waste your time. Because even then, 2,000 years ago or so, he had a sense of urgency that the Lord could come back any time. We don't have time to waste. We don't have time to goof around. So, in a sense, get to it. In verse 6, and again, these are just practical points, and this is the last of them uh, in this letter. He says, Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. And so it, it's the exhortation that our speech is to be full of grace, 
speech that honors God, and at the same time, speech that is seasoned with salt. You know, to, uh, one of my go-to verses on how to communicate, not that I always abide by this uh, in my own foolishness, but uh, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29, Paul exhorts the Ephesians and he says, let no corrupt word, or King James says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification that it may impart grace to the hearer. And, and, and so it's being careful what we say, and, and it's to be seasoned with salt. And when you think about salt, when you put it on food, it can be savory. Uh, when it, it can kind of uh, generate thirst. You ever, you, ever, you ever talk with somebody and wish they would say more? Or you listen to a teacher, and, and, and he just wets your whistle for what, what he's talking about, and it's like you're sad when the study's over, or you're sad when you know, the lecture's over, or whatever. It's like you're left wanting for more. And, and so it's seasoned with salt. But, you know, salt also acts as a preservative. And, and sometimes when you apply salt in different places, it can sting. You know, I, I, I remember a couple times, you know, shaving and stuff and then jumping in the ocean. It's like my neck's on fire, you know, because it's uh, all those little cuts on my neck or whatever. You know, and, and sometimes when we speak in a way that it's seasoned with salt, sometimes the person hearing that kind of go, ooh, that kind of stings a little bit. You ever have the word of God sting you? Sometimes that's what it does, but you know, we're called to have a, a balance of that. And again, speaking the truth in love. Uh, Paul tells us that in Ephesians 4.15. 4, speaking the truth in love. I heard from John Corson uh, in one of his studies a long time ago that to speak the truth without love is brutality, but to speak love without the truth is hypocrisy. And so what it gets down to, if we're going to speak the truth in love, we have to know what to say, and we have to know how to say it. Because sometimes you can say the most truthful thing, the, the best thing the person really needs to hear, but because of the, the method of delivery, they can't hear it. And so if we're going to communicate effectively, we have to understand where the other person is coming from and, and to a degree cater to them that they can actually receive it. I, I can't talk to my grandson, Lukey, like I would talk to you guys. In fact, I can hardly talk to him at all. I can't understand him. But, you know, but I mean, when he's able to talk, when he's maybe another year old or those kinds of things, you, you can't talk to a three- or four-year-old child about algebra. You can. They'll just look at you and smile. <laughs> but if you really want to communicate to them, then somehow you've got, to, you've got to tailor that in such a way. And again, this is a matter of knowing what to say, but also how to say it. And... I believe that the Holy Spirit will guide and equip us for both, leading us both in what to say and how to say it. Peter tells us in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason for the hope that's in you, with meekness and fear. Meekness and fear being key phrases and how that delivery should be uh, conducted. But he says, be ready, you know, walking in the Spirit. Uh, denying the lust of the flesh, you know, study to show yourself approved unto God, rightly dividing the word of truth. All those things come into play. Again, as part of speaking the truth in love, as Paul tells the Ephesians. So the, the rest of the letter, uh, the remainder of this uh, chapter anyway, is introductions and acknowledgments. Uh, Paul uh, names ten different people, uh, Tychicus, Onesimus, Ar Aristarchus, Mark, uh, Jesus, or also known as Justice, Epaphras, Luke, Demas, Nymphus, and Archippus. And, uh, and all cool names. Um, but um, so, you know, he acknowledges that they're fellow servants, that they're faithful, uh, that they've been men that have been used by God, uh, that men that have blessed him, that he's had fellowship with. And the fact that he remembers their names is significant in the sense that they had a vital ministry uh, with Paul or to Paul in such a way that their names are actually memorialized in the Word of God for all of eternity. That's pretty cool, you know. That's uh, pretty slick. And then he ends the letter uh, there in verse 18. He says, Grace be with you. Amen. And so this letter ends exactly the way it started. Grace and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. And so I like the bookends of grace on both sides of this. It's uh, pretty cool. So that's, uh, that's the book of Ephesians or Colossians. And uh, next week, 
Actually, next week, you've got a special guest teacher. Uh, Andrew Marnell will be here. Then the week after that, uh, we're going to dig into the book of Thessalonians. And so, uh, looking forward to that a lot. Uh, with uh, the completion of Colossians, uh, our church has now gone through 73% of the Bible. Actually, 73.06% of the Bible. And so, uh, not that anyone's counting, but uh, there you are. Gracious Father, we thank you for your word. Uh, we thank you uh, for the, the bigger picture. And we thank you, Lord, that you are the preeminent one. And, and we ask that you would help us to allow you to be preeminent in each of our hearts, in each of our lives. And so, guide us by your spirit, Father. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hey, if you're able, let's uh, stand together and continue to worship.
Redeemer, Redeemer, Savior, sing his name, Jesus, Jesus. Lord Jesus, we thank you that we have you as our Savior. We thank you, Lord, that you are so faithful and so good. And Lord, you teach us your ways and you reveal yourself afresh and you guide us, Lord, by your spirit. And Lord, thank you. Thank you for reaching down from heaven and, and touching our lives. Lord, thank you for redeeming us and calling us your own. Thank you for being the living hope. We love you, Lord, and we ask that you be glorified in each of our hearts and each of our lives. We commit our ways to you afresh, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Lord bless thee. The Lord bless thee. And keep thee. And keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee. And be gracious unto thee. And be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up. The Lord lift up. His countenance, His countenance upon thee, and give thee peace. Well, I pray that our Lord continues to speak to you and bless you and, and guide you by His Spirit, and that He gives you just a really good night's rest, and that you just wake up in the morning refreshed and singing His praises. God bless you guys. Have a great night. If you need prayer for any reason, come on up. Myself and the others, we'd love to pray with you.